Beautiful singing. Thank you all ladies. We're in Luke this evening, Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter number 14. Find your place. Stand with me, please. Luke chapter number 14. We'll begin reading in verse number 25. The Bible says, And there went great multitudes with him. And he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost whether he hath sufficient to finish it? Lest haply after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it all, that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you, that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Tonight we're going to look at part 11 of the series. And the title of the message tonight is The Cost of the Christian Family. The Cost of the Christian Family. Lord, we pray that you would help us tonight. I pray that you'd work in our hearts, take the word of God, minister to us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing you can be seated. These verses are dealing with the subject of discipleship. Jesus says, if any man come to me, in verse number 26. He goes on to say in verse number 33, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. But I thought about this in these verses that deal with discipleship deal with following Christ, what greater verses to use as a springboard and a proof text tonight for the Christian family. I believe that the raising of a Christian home, a Christian family, is as important of a priority for discipleship as the New Testament local church. As parents, we should be trying to raise children that are followers of Jesus Christ disciples of Jesus Christ. And in order to have a Christian family, you have got to follow Christ. That's been uh, the underlying uh, theme throughout this entire series. I want to, by way of introduction tonight, just give you three simple points before we get into the message. Ask the Lord to help us. We see, first of all, the building that is undertaken in verse number 28. The Bible says, for which of you intending to build a tower? I want to say tonight that good intentions are not enough. Good intentions are not enough. Samuel Johnson said the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Thomas Edison said a good intention with a bad approach often leads to poor results. Well, what a quote when you're looking at many times a Christian family and parents sit through series like this, messages like this, and they congregate in the altar at the end of the service and they say, we're going to have a Christian family. And they fully intend to. They've got all the plans in the world. They have these visions of, of grandeur. They have these ideas of the kind of family that they want to have and the kind of marriage that they want to have and the kind of children that they want to have. They, they imagine and they envision and they have these intentions of the kind of testimony and the reputation that they want to have as a family, but that's not enough. The building that is undertaken Secondly, we see the burden that is unpleasant. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost whether he have sufficient 
to finish it. See, it's easy to imagine. It's easy to dream. It's easy to sit back and picture in your mind the kind of family, the kind of home that you want to have. It is easy to walk down the aisle during the invitation and have good intentions. It's another thing to do all the homework that goes into counting the cost. Counting the cost is a lot of trouble. If you've ever done any kind of a project, building project or construction project, there are, there's an enormous amount of work that goes into counting the cost. We would say it in the construction industry, we got to figure up our materials. That's how we say it. We got to figure up the materials. And I don't care how much construction you do. I don't care how long you've been doing it. I don't care how much experience you have. Every project requires its own individual counting of the cost. And you've got to sit down and you've got to draw up a list of everything you're going to need. Understanding that you're going to forget something. Understanding that you think, okay, I got it all figured out. I don't care if you're building a dog house. I don't care if you're building a shed. I don't care what you're doing. I don't care if you're doing a room addition in your house or remodeling something. There is a lot that goes into it. There are a lot of hidden costs. There are a lot of unexpected expenses. There are a lot of details. And before you start the project, you better make sure you can afford to finish it before you start. Requires a lot of planning. Requires a lot of decision making. It requires a lot of research. It requires, here we go again, a lot of math. You got to do the math. That's what's happening here in verse number 28. You're counting the cost. There's your math. You got to work out the math problems. It's painstaking. It's very detailed. There are a lot of things that if you're not careful, you'll overlook. You'll turn around and the contractor will say, Where's this? You say, oh man, I was supposed to pick that up. I forgot about that. I thought I got everything you wanted. Yeah, but I got to have this. I can't, the project can't go any further till you get this or this. My mind's racing right now about all the times that I've had to get material together for a job and I don't care how long you've been doing it, invariably you're going to forget something. You got to go back to the store, run back to Home Depot, Run back to the shop, whatever. And my pet peeve is forgetting my tools. I go down through the job and maybe we're doing a project up here at the church. You look around all the work that we've done up here and we use most of my tools and I'm at the house, I'm going, okay, I need to take this and this and this and this and this. And I put all my tools in the truck and I look at everything and so I believe I got everything. And I get down here, start unloading the truck and somebody look at me and say, what about this? I'm like, oh man, I forgot that. I forgot that. What else did I forget before I go back to the house? What else did I forget? That, that same idea goes into the Christian family. There are a whole lot more to having a Christian family than just having good intentions. You got to do your homework. Now, nobody likes homework. But you can't have a Christian family without homework. You can't have a Christ-centered home, come on, y'all, without homework. It's not going to happen by accident. Just like this trim didn't make it up on this wall by accident, these columns and beams it, and the stonework didn't just overnight. I mean, I mean, I had when I when I when I when I envisioned doing this project, I got on the computer and I, and I, and I did some I did some renderings and and put some three D renderings in there and and I had them throw it up on the screen and I said, Church, this is what we're going to do. And I was like, Yeah, that looks great. Hey, it looked great on the computer. It looked good on paper, but it didn't make it happen. We got a lot of people that think they want a Christian family till they realize what all goes into it. We see, thirdly, the beholders that are unimpressed. The Bible says in verse number 29, lest haply or perhaps after he hath laid the foundation, 
and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. And I want to just say this. You don't have a Christian family to impress people. That's not why you have a Christian family. It's to impress people. But you're going to make an impression on people one way or the other. You're, they're going to be left with an impression of you as a daddy and as a mother and as a couple and as a, as a family. There, people's going to have an impression of you whether you, whether you do anything or not. People are watching. New Christians are watching. It's going to get quiet, but that's okay. A family that just got saved ought to be able to look at a family that's been saved for five years and learn something. Uh, we, got, we, got, we got a basketball team. We got two basketball teams. We got a girl basketball team and a boys basketball team. But we've got the junior varsity and we got the varsity. We got a, we got some, 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 uh, we got a senior. We got a senior. You're a senior this year, ain't you, Nick? Trent, are you, are you a senior? You're a junior. All right, listen to him. We got some, we got some younger players. What, what, what's the lowest grade? Sixth grade. We got some sixth graders on the basketball team. I'm just going to go ahead and say this. You ought to be able to teach them something. It's their first year. You've been playing for a few years. They ought to be able to look to you as a pattern and as, 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 as someone that can show them some things. Well, the same thing applies to new Christians. New Christians that are coming in here and they hear messages like uh, the Christian family. And they say, they say, um, I, don't, I don't understand why I've been saved six weeks and I already know this and this and this and this family over here has been saved for five years. You're not doing it to impress them but you are leaving an impression on them. Well, I'm thinking to myself that the people that are watching will draw conclusions about your seriousness. I don't think I upload them, Spencer. Don't worry about it. So we've got, we've got this foundation. We've got this foundation. But that's not enough. What is the foundation of a Christian family? Well, Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, I'm saved. Everybody in my family's saved. That's wonderful. You've got to build on that. Being saved is not enough to have a Christian family. Man, my mind's just racing. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, he said, he said, according, verse number 10, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So just being saved does not constitute having a Christian family any more than having a foundation means you've got a tower or a house or a building. The foundation's where you start. Foundation's where you start. You build on the foundation. Getting saved is a given that you have to be saved. Being saved is where you start. Being saved is not where you sit back and say, we got a Christian family now. No, that's not how that works. And the Bible says in verse number 29 that having the foundation is not enough. You got to build on that foundation. By the way, the people that are watching cannot and should not take away from your intentions. And those that are watching cannot help you count the cost. Every Christian family has got their own material list they got to get up. 
It's going to cost everybody something and it's going to cost everybody something different. My wife and I both grew up in Christian homes. Our dads were preachers, pastors. We grew up in the ministry. We grew up preacher's kids. We grew up, grew up in church. Just preacher's, preacher's daughter pretty much her whole life. You was born when your daddy was in Bible college, right? He got out of Bible college and moved to Harlem, Georgia, Deering, Georgia, and her daddy pastored her, it was her pastor her whole life. I got saved when I was four. She got saved when she was seven. And one of the things that we did to count the cost, so y'all listen to me. One of the things that we did to count the cost about having a Christian family was we started running the numbers before we ever even got a boyfriend and a girlfriend. Before I even started courting her, I had already counted the cost and figured up what kind of material I wanted to work with. Huh? And when I get a stack of lumber from the store and I pop the bands on that thing and I got a bunch of two by fours and two by sixes and two by eights, some of them are all curled up and twisted and gnarly. And what you do is you call those out. You put those to the side. You can use them for braces and cut them up and use them for blocks. But you don't use a bowed curved stud that looks like a banana or a rocking chair. You don't put that in the wall or you're going to have a hump in your wall. You got you to go through your material. If you want to have a nice house, you got to use nice material. If you want to have a Christian family, you got to have some Christian components to work with. So before I even had a family, before I even got married and had children, I had already figured out what kind of wife I wanted. I had the criteria and prayed for God to bring that woman into my life. We were talking about this at lunch today. And Spencer and Cherith was sharing their testimony. The Latos were over there and Nick and Rainey was over there. Spencer, can I tell you a little bit about what you said? Is that all right? I'd love to get you up here to do it. You'd do a better job than I would. I'd sit down and let you tell it. That when, he, when, when Spencer and Cherith, by the way, they've known each other for years. They was in our church in South, in South Carolina. They were in our church for 10 years down there and she was at our house all the time. They grew up together. There's, her family's still at the church I pastored. But when they got to talking to one another and realized that you know, they were starting to get a little bit Twitter-pated. <laughs> Spencer said he sat down with, with Cherith and said, before we even commence, we need to have a come to Jesus meeting. And he said they sat there in her mama's living room for hours. And he said he told her everything that he could think of that would be a deal breaker for her. This is the kind of family I want. These are the kind of kids we're going to raise. This is how we're going to do our discipline. These are the standards. These are the convictions. These are the guidelines. This is how it's going to be. This is what we're going to do. And if you and I are going to get together, you got to agree to this. And she said, sounds good to me. And Spencer's like, okay, now we can go to the second step. But that step right there is what I'm preaching about. The counting the cost. See, we got a lot of people today, they just grab the first thing that comes floating down the stream. They get married out of the will of God. They don't court right. They don't date right. They don't even do any of that right. They start off on the wrong foot and then they get married or they have to get married or they never get married. They just live together or whatever dynamic you want to come up with. And then they hear messages like this. They go, okay, I want a Christian family. Well, you're going to have to count the cost. And if you didn't start out right, it's going to cost you a whole lot more than if you started out right. Amen. Amen. Those of us that do construction projects have been brought in many times to do the next phase of the project only to realize that what's been done before we got there was done wrong. You don't, you don't add to that. You got to back up and rip all that out and you got to fix it before you move forward. You don't just cover up stuff that's wrong. When we was remodeling this house over here behind the church for the mission house, 
in my mind, I said, we're just gonna go in there. We're gonna paint. We're gonna replace the carpet. Just do some aesthetics and make it look better. Maybe remodel the kitchen, put some new cabinets, countertops in there. And we got in there and we started looking. I was like, well, that, that, we can't cover that up. That's got to come out. And that's got to come out. And that's got to come out. Next thing you know, we got a big old dumpster out there that we had them haul off a couple times full of stuff that we ripped out before we ever began construction. We had to do a whole lot of demolition. You don't go in there and lay tile on a floor that's got an inch and a half sag in it in 10 feet. I ran a string from one side of that kitchen to the other and you could slide your hand up under it. So now I got to get under the house. I got to get my jack and we jacked it up and we put pressure treated six by sixes in there and boy, it was popping and it was cracking and it sounded like Rice Krispies. I mean, it was, it was making all kind of racket and they're up there going, preacher, are you okay? I'm saying, if I get buried under here, just leave me. <laughs> but we got to fix this. We can't, I, I kept saying, we can't leave this like this. I wonder how long it's been like this. I don't know, but it's fixing to get fixed. That's a good old Southern phrase right there. It's fixing to get fixed. We fixing to fix it. Amen. And before we started on the kitchen, we had to go in the basement and jack up the whole floor system and reinforce it. Then we worked on the kitchen. Well, here's what we got. We got a lot of people get saved. They come into the church. They look around and they see some Christian families in the church. They go, I want that. And they just start slapping some paint and wallpaper on an absolute mess. I don't even know if I'm going to get to my message. I guess I did upload it. I do crazy stuff. I, I make all, all this work and sometimes I forget to upload it. And sometimes there's typos and they're like, preacher, you're, you had a misspell word on there. I was like, I just did that to make sure you was paying attention. <laughs> I don't spend a lot of time on the PowerPoints. But the people looking, so I thought you said you wanted a Christian family. You started out. It's like the, like the story of the hare and the tortoise. Started out like, started out like Ghostbusters, buddy. Woo! We're going to have a Christian family. Gather all your kids around. Tell them all the stuff we're going to do. And this is how it's going to be in about two weeks into it fizzles out. A lot of people's idea of a Christian home and the commitment to the Christian home is about as serious as their New Year's resolutions about losing weight. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to get in shape. About the middle of January, they're sitting at the dunk and eating a dozen donuts. <laughs> what happened to your diet, man? It's hard. Lord, it's hard. Just can't do it. I thought you was going to have a Christian family. Yeah, we wanted one, but man, it's hard. A lot to it. Yeah, there's a lot to it. You better believe there's a lot to it. It's going to cost you. There'll be a lot of beholders, as our text says. All them that behold it. Your co-workers on the job that you're inviting to church. You got to come to my church, man. You gotta come to our church. Preachers preaching a series on the Christian family. You gotta come to, you gotta come to our church. Your pastor preaching a series on the Christian family. Yeah, he's on like part eleven. Part eleven. Well, your your wife and kids showed up a while ago to bring you your lunchbox that you left at the house, and I'd have never in my life dreamed y'all heard any preaching on the Christian family the way they're all carrying on. There's gonna be beholders. getting quiet in here. You don't have a Christian family to impress people, but you're going to make an impression on people regardless. Just like you don't practice basketball, guys, and you don't do all the drills so that you, people in the bleachers are going, oh man, he's good, he's good. You do all that so that you can win. And if you're doing it for the right reason and you're practicing and you're putting in the hours and the training, they will say, man, he's a good player. You know what else they're going to say? Man, he's garbage. That poor guy right there's got zero athletic ability. 
You might not be trying to impress people, but you're going to impress them one way or the other. All that behold it. Preacher, why you make such a big deal out of the beholders? Jesus is the one that mentioned it, not me. Jesus is the one that said, if you're going to build a tower, sit down and count the cost because when you don't count the cost, all the people standing around are going to behold it and they're going to begin to mock you saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. So it seems to me that that ought to be some kind of motivation to do it right. You need more in a foundation. There's going to be some cost involved. We'll see how far we get tonight. Number one, look in our text. It's going to, it might cost you family that want to steal the preeminence in your life. Look at verse number 26. If any man come to me, Jesus really wasn't a salesman, was he? Jesus really didn't study the modern day salesman techniques. He turned to this great multitude in verse number 25 and here's what he said, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. How's that for a sales pitch? Before you follow me, before we get too far down the road, let me just go ahead and tell you. Your love for me has got to be so supreme that it makes the love for your family look like hate. That's what he meant. If any man come to me, hate not his father, his mother. We got missionaries right now on that screen back yonder. As those missionaries' pictures are rolling through and popping up while I'm preaching. And they're in countries where there's predominantly Muslim. And you call those people, you read their prayer letters, and they've got a congregation of converts. Every single one of the people in their church had to choose Jesus Christ over their family. Hey, you go to Israel. Those, those Jewish people, when a, when, a, when a member of their family turns to Jesus Christ and accepts Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior and as their Messiah, that whole family dynamic changes. Brother Sasser will tell you. They have to make a decision. When we were missionaries in South Africa, we really had more trouble with the white South Africans than we did the Africans. The Africans had so, much, so many flavors of Christianity that it really wasn't that big of a deal. But I tell you what, I tell you where the rubber meets the road is when you find a, a, a man in South Africa that grew up in the Dutch Reformed Church and was sprinkled as a baby. And they make it a huge cultural thing where they dress the baby in this long white frilly gown with lace and they have this huge family get together at the church and, and, the, and, the, and the Dutch Reformed minister sprinkles the baby and they go home, they have this huge cookout. I mean, it's, it's a big deal. It'd be almost in, 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 in uh, merit. It'd be almost as like a bar mitzvah or something for the Jewish community. It's a huge deal. It's family, it's culture. It's a big deal. And then they, they, they get saved and they come sit under the preaching and they realize that that didn't count. That's not biblical baptism. That they need to be immersed in deep water after salvation. And all of a sudden they're confronted with this major personal crisis. Am I going to get baptized or am I going to hold on to my family traditions? I'm going to tell you something. I was shocked at how many grown men, I'm talking about men married with kids and a job and a house and vehicles, said, I can't get baptized. That's going to hurt my mom and daddy's feelings. And then you read verses to them like this right here and say, that's what he's talking about. If any man come to me and hate not his father and his mother, you can't have the wishes and the whims and the desires of your parents navigating your life, you've got to decide, are you going to build this thing or not? Father, mother, wife. Oh, you want to try to have a Christian family without the husband and the wife both being on board 
It's hard. It's hard. It's difficult. I remember the story of Steve Powers, the man that taught me a lot about carpentry. I worked with him for a, a number of months before I went in business for myself. He framed a house out in the middle of nowhere and they didn't have the power pole out there yet. And I said to him, I said, did you rent a generator? He said, no. I said, how'd you frame that house? He said, with a chainsaw. And I said, what? He said, I used a chainsaw. He said, I used a chainsaw for the rafters. I put the bird mouths on the bottom of the rafters and the rafter tails. I cut every stud, every plate with a chainsaw. He said, I squared up my line, laid up there on the saw benches, and I used a chainsaw. I said, man, that sounds like that was hard. He said, it was hard, but I did it. Having a Christian home when one of the parents is not on board is hard. Father, mother, wife, children. My children don't really want to have a Christian family. It's not up to them. It's not up to them. I'm amazed at how many parents let the carnality of their children dictate the spirituality of that family. Unbelievable. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's older, not depart from it. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The children don't get a vote on whether or not you have a Christian family. You lay down the rules, you lay down the law, and you establish the, uh, the, the chain of command, and you have the biblical precepts and the teaching, and you pour it into your children. And brethren and sisters, brethren and sisters, family, we're talking about family, family that will steal the preeminence in your home. Your children's aunts and uncles, you might have to pull back. Yes, sir. We're talking about the cost. Is everybody still with me? But I want my kids to know their aunts and uncles. How well do you want them to know them? How, how willing are you to, to have your children exposed over extended periods of time to, to, to men and women that are not saved, that are, or that are living in rebellion to the word of God? How important is it for you to have a Christian home? Are you willing to pay the cost? Because it's going to cost you something. Preacher, I want a Christian home, but man, I just can't handle no drama in my family. Well, if you have a Christian home, unless everybody in your whole sphere is saved, you're going to have drama. You're going to have drama. I'm going to go ahead and tell you. It's going to happen. Grandma and grandpa ain't going to approve of your discipline methods. They're not going to even, maybe some of them won't even approve of you putting your child in a Christian school. They'll give you a hard time about you putting your children in a Christian school. And they'll say things to you like, well, we put you in public school and you turned out all right. And you're like, yeah, I was a drug addict. What are you talking about? I was a drunk. I was a whoremonger. I was a fornicator. I was a blasphemer. What do you mean I turned out all right? I turned out because I got saved. I don't want my kids exposed to that mess. I don't want my kids exposed to the teaching of humanism and evolution and Marxism and socialism and transgender ideology. I don't want this shove down my children's throat, sex education and a bunch of drag queens reading to them in the library. I don't want my kids around that. You got family members that's gonna have a problem with that. You better make your mind up whether or not you're gonna pay the cost. You better make your mind up. Having good intentions is one thing, but you need more than a foundation to build on. They're going to give you a hard time about the Christian school. They're going to give you a hard time about your kids being down here at church. You take those kids to church for everything. They ain't got a problem with them having ball practice every night. They don't have a problem with them having Little League every Saturday. They don't have a problem with none of that stuff, but bring them down here where God's at and they got a problem with it. If you let them dictate, you won't have a Christian family. I know what I'm talking about. This ain't my first rodeo. Watch grown men and grown women completely cower to their unsaved family members. 
brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also. There's going to be things God wants you to do that you're not going to want to like to do. God's going to put some demands on you that's going to go against your own flesh and your own desires. You've got to love him more than you love yourself. Amen. You say, well, I just don't really think that all that's necessary. I'm going to tell you how unnecessary it is. Jesus said in verse number 33, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. <coughs> Sounds to me like there's a cost. There's a price tag on this thing. And the context is just being a disciple. I already said that. But we're making it apply to having a Christian home, Christian family, because the same thing applies. You can't drop your kids off at some family member's house and leave them. When that family member you know does not agree or believe what you believe. You can't do it. I'm not saying you can't have them in your life. I think you ought to make every possible effort to have them in your life. Romans 12 says, as much as life in you live peaceably with all men. But that don't mean you've got to turn your kids loose with them. I don't know who needs to hear this tonight. Somebody needs to hear this. Grandma and grandpa is going to act like those kids are theirs. Those are my kids. Well, you're the parents. You may have to just look at them with the love of Jesus and say, no. You say, are they going to get mad? Let them get mad. That's their problem. You got to count the cost. Is everybody still with me? I mean, this is what Jesus said. Turn with me quickly to Matthew chapter number 12. I don't think I'm going to move any further than this point right here. I got two more points, but I don't want to rush it and I'm tired. So we're just going to hunker down right here for a minute. Look at, look at Matthew chapter number 12. I want you to see what Jesus said. In Matthew chapter number 12, verse number 46. While he yet talked to the people, this is Jesus. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without desiring to speak with him. Now we know who his mother was. His mother was Mary. And the Bible tells us she was a chaste and godly, I mean, God handpicked that woman to be the mother of the incarnate Son of God. She was as, she was as pure as the driven snow. She was, I mean, she, she was so in tune with God that God overshadowed her with the Holy Ghost and let her have the Son of God. And then after Jesus was born, then Joseph and Mary got married, came together, consummated their marriage in a physical relationship and were married and had more children. Okay, that's for those of you that believe in the, in the perpetual, immaculate, whatever conception of Mary. She got married and had children. She wasn't a virgin after Jesus was born. Is everybody still with me? The Catholic Church teaches that, but they're off on a lot of things. I love them, but they just need to study their Bible. It bothers me when they come up with stuff that's not in the Bible. It bothers me. The Bible says here, while he spake to, his, to the people, behold, his, bro, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to speak with thee. Now Jesus is in the middle of preaching. Jesus is in the middle of, 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 of answering these scribes and Pharisees in verse 38. He's, he's preaching, he's teaching, he's doing what God's called him to do. And they came to him and said, Hey, your mother and your brother are outside. They want to talk to you. He answered and said unto them, Who is my mother? And who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Now, what was he saying? I'm telling you what he was saying. My heavenly Father has preeminence 
over my earthly mother and brethren. That's what he was saying. But here's what else he was saying. And here's what some Christians in this church need to understand. You got two families. Come on, tell it. Right. You got two families. You got the family that you was born into. That's your mama, your daddy, your brothers and sisters, your aunts and uncles. That's all, all your crazy kin folk that you're going to be eating with here in a couple of days at Thanksgiving. And you're going to be rolling your eyes going, I do not know these people. We cannot be on the same family tree. That's the family that you were born into. But then you got the family that you was born again into. Right. And that'd be us. And listen to me, I know you don't like what I'm saying. There are going to be times when you've got to figure out which family you want to run with. Amen. Right. I can't say it no plainer than that. You've got the family you was born into and you've got the family you was born again into. Some of you need to understand that according to the scriptures, Jesus Christ with Mary the holy, beloved, godly Mary and his brethren stand out there. He said, who's my mother? I got to do, I got to do the will of my father. See, that's exactly what conversation they had in Luke chapter number two. When he was, remember when they lost him and he was in the temple and Mary said, Man, your, your father and I, I've been looking for you for three days. He said, wish you not that I must be about my capital F father's business. That was a real nice way of saying, Joseph's not my father. That's my father. Same thing here. It might cost some of you family members that are trying to steal the preeminence in your life to take you away essentially from being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Because you can't follow Jesus and follow your lost family members at the same time when you're headed in two opposite directions. Amen. Just learn to say no. Listen to me. Man. You can't teach your children to say no to peer pressure if you're not willing to say no to peer pressure. How are you going to have a godly family? How are you going to have a Christian family if you let lost family members set the rules in your home? You leave your kids over there and they start popping in movies and they start popping in CDs and music and junk and your kids are sitting there in a hell hole. And every time you get them back from your family, you got to get a pressure washer out and knock all the filth off of them. That's serious. It's serious. And not all, fam not all families can, can get together and have, have a great time over an extended period of time without at some point, you got to say, folks, it's been great. We're going to bounce. Slip in there on Thursday, slip in there on Thursday, and, and eat a turkey leg and, 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 and crack a joke with Uncle Lamar and, and, and hug Aunt, Aunt Lucy. And then when the profanity and the filth and the blasphemy starts and they start pulling the beer out of the refrigerator and they start cranking the music up and lighting up the marijuana, it's time to bounce. Love all y'all. Appreciate everybody. It's been great. We got to go. Where are you going? We got to go. Where are you going? We got to go. Where are you going? We got to go. See, they want to make a big deal out of it. We got to go. We got to go. Can't stay. We got to go. Well, why y'all got to leave? Y'all just got here. We got to go. We got to go. We love y'all. We got to go. You ain't got to be a jerk. You ain't got to be mean. You ain't got to be hateful. But you got to get your kids out from under that. I could sit here and tell you story after story after story, but I'm not because we're on the internet. I know what I'm talking about. Now, my wife's side of the family, it's rare. There's five of, there's five of them. Her and her two sisters and her two brothers, there's five of them. And both, both the boys are, pre, are Baptist pastors and all three daughters are Baptist pastors' wives. 
And when we all get together, there's about 70 of us. Everybody's saved and serving God. It's unbelievable. We'll be together for a couple of days and we want nobody to have no fights, no knockout drag outs. We want nobody to be pulling nobody's hair. We won't hear one single cuss word the whole time we're down there. We'll go to Georgia Wednesday. I'll fly down there Wednesday. I'll preach Wednesday night at Antioch, my home church. We'll be down there all day Thursday and Friday with family. There'll be kids running everywhere. There'll be aunts and uncles everywhere. There'll be food everywhere. And we'll be down there and all we're going to do is talk about God and the things of God, the church, and all of us preachers just preach to one another. That's all we do. Have you seen this? Have you heard this? Hey, I preached this the other day. And you wait for them to get done giving you their outline so you can give them yours. That's all we do. Talk about God. Things of God. But I can tell you right now, if I walk in there and a bunch of nonsense started, I'd gather my family up and hit the road. He said, but it's family. I don't care who it is. You ain't got to sit under it. See, this was the message God laid on my heart right here before Thanksgiving. Can you believe it? Right here before Christmas. And they'll try to make you feel, you'll try to make you feel like you're not even a Christian because you won't stay there and watch them smoke marijuana and drink liquor. Man, I got two more points, but I better stop. Somebody needed this tonight. You need more than good intentions. You got to get your calculator out. Am I real, do I really want a Christian family? Is it really important to me to keep my children pure? Because it don't make no sense to me to bring them to a church like Calvary and put them in a school like Calvary Baptist School and then drop them off in a hellhole. That doesn't make any sense to me. I'm sorry that I don't understand the logic of that. That's like taking your dog to the groomer to get shampooed and get his hair cut and put, in, put a nice little uh, uh, a collar on it and then take it and drop it off in a hog pen. How much sense would that make? You just undid everything you just did. And God ain't the only one that sows seed. The devil sows seed. And some of y'all need to go back, listen to that message I preached last year on the wild grapes. Where did the wild come from? I tell you where the wild grapes came from. Those, that vineyard was planted with choice vines. Choice vines. The best vines in the most fertile hill and the, and, the, and the man pulled all the rocks out and put a fence up and built a tower and he built a wine press and when he went to get the grapes, they were wild. You know what happened? Cross-pollination. Wild grapes over there, the pollen carried by the wind, landed on those perfect, beautiful choice vines with so much potential and ruined them. Amen. And that's exactly what the devil wants to do with your family. He wants to cross-pollinate and undermine your efforts to have a Christian family. I wonder this evening with the pianist coming, somebody needs to get in this altar right here before the holidays and say, Lord, I need wisdom. I need wisdom I need spiritual discernment. I need courage. I need a backbone. I need some grit. I need a whole lot of love. I need a whole lot of wisdom. You're going to find yourself this week, this week, Thanksgiving week, you're going to find yourself this week in a position where you've got to make a decision. Do I sit here or do I get up and leave? 